Okay, this video is called Do All Roads Lead to Rome and to Calcium? So what this is about is I've been studying a lot about calcium signaling in brain cells and neurons and I'm seeing new interesting things that I think are worth talking about and so basically the key point of this whole talk is almost all the bad things that are happening to brain cells lead to increased calcium in the cytoplasm of the neuron. All right, that includes high dietary sodium because it dissipates the sodium uh, plasma membrane gradients that makes you less able to pump out the calcium because the calcium pumps like the knockout exchanger. I'll show you the pictures of all this stuff in more detail, but this is a quick summary slide then I'll explain it in more detail. But um, excess dietary sodium leads to increased cytoplasm calcium. And the reason that's a big deal is just like the joke of the Lord of the Rings, one ring to control them all. This is the ion, calcium, that controls everything inside of a cell. In general, the most important thing a cell does will typically be switched on by increased calcium in the cytoplasm. And lots of things will cause that. Um, lack of oxygen delivery, ischemia will cause it. Circa inhibitors, sarcoplasm, endoplasmic reticulum, calcium inhibitors. And again, this is a quick overview of this slide, then I'm going to go into the actual pictures. It'll make more sense. Mitochondrial inhibitors, traumatic brain injury, cell phone, Wi-Fi, EMF, opening up voltage-gated calcium channels, the no-oh-no -no pathway, excess uh, oxidative stress, reactive oxygen species, stress, sleep, and deprivation, and caffeine. They're all the same thing. Okay, kind of like excitotoxins, basically. Increased glutamate transmission or aspartame um, or glycine with GP. Um, all of those things cause increased activation of the postsynaptic neuron, leading to increased cytoplasm calcium. The whole leaky gut, gums, dormant bacteria theory of Ethericia Pretorius and Douglas Kell. I'm not going to get into that with this talk. I've talked about that in other lectures rather extensively. Um, lack of dietary potassium or magnesium. The vasodilators come from plant foods. The reason why this slide is so beneficial is when you look at this slide, what you want to do to avoid having this problem, excessive uh, calcium in the cytoplasm, meaning ramped up metabolic rate, potentially leading to neurovascular uncoupling, whereby the nerve can't get enough energy delivered to it, enough oxygen and glucose delivery to it, such that it may go into apoptosis and die. So if you want to prevent that, which of course we do, just avoid all this stuff. Okay. And I'll show what it means and how to do that in just a moment. Okay, I've given a whole bunch of lectures before about these plasma membrane potassium sodium pumps and how you're pumping out more positive charge, leading to a net negative intracellular charge. That's an electrical gradient. The difference in concentration of sodium inside versus outside gives you a chemical gradient for sodium. Typically, you're about 10 times higher sodium, 140 outside the cell and 14 inside the cell. Uh, Two-thirds of the energy of a neuron goes to this uh, pump here using ATP. You need magnesium to stabilize the ATP. That's why magnesium is so important here. But two-thirds of neuron energy goes to this because it's so important to have a battery produced across the plasma cell membrane of a neuron. Here's what the magnesium does. Magnesium with its two plus charge, it stabilizes the second and the third phosphate on ATP, adenosine triphosphate, because these negative charges want to push away from each other. That's why you know adding a phosphate onto something has such a big effect. That negative charge then repels other negative charges on the molecule it's attached to, excuse me, and that uh, will cause it to move and do some useful work. Okay, here's how a cell really does business. You got the potassium sodium ATPase pump establishing this gradient, and then this gradient is coupled to pumping other things. It'll pump calcium out of the cell, for example. Because normally the cellular concentration of calcium intracellular in the cytoplasm is very, very low. It's about 15,000 times lower than it was than what it is outside the cell. And so when that calcium comes up, that transient bump up in calcium concentration gets the cell to do things. So in a typical neuron, it gets it to release its neurotransmitter. So glutamate's about 80% of the neurotransmitters in the brain. So a typical thing is the synaptic vesicle containing glutamate neurotransmitter will merge with the plasma membrane of the neuron at the synaptic cleft, and then it'll diffuse across to the postsynaptic uh, neuron and exert an effect upon it. Within muscle cells, it'll cause them to contract. In order to prevent hypertension, you want to have at least, at least, five times more potassium in your diet than sodium, which is very easy to do. If you eat a plant-based diet, you'll probably be around you know, 20 times as much uh, potassium as sodium typically. I don't even keep track. I think our ancestors probably ate about 25 times as much uh, potassium as sodium. But anyways, this is called the K factor, the ratio of potassium to sodium. And potassium is a vasodilator. Sodium is a vasoconstrictor. And as Dennis Burke had said, there is no animal other than modern man who eats more sodium than potassium. Okay, you get lots of potassium from plant foods. P for potassium, P for plant foods. 
sodium you get from processed foods, plus sometimes it's added to meat as a preservative or for flavoring. Okay, here's a typical brain cell and neuron. Here's a cell body. An action potential is conducted from the beginning right here of the axon. This is called the axon hillock. It's primarily run by sodium channels initially to depolarize the cell. When it reaches the synaptic terminal, this latter part of the neuron here, calcium enters the neuron through these voltage-gated calcium channels, and they will then cause the neurotransmitter here in a synaptic vesicle to travel to the plasma membrane of the neuron at the synaptic cleft, synaptic cleft, diffuse across the synaptic cleft, exert an effect on the postsynaptic neuron. That's how messages are delivered in the brain. We talked before about how neurons also have glucose type 4 transporters, so they are sensitive to insulin resistance. Um, I covered that much more extensively in other lectures. Here's a little bit more on calcium that when you get a bump up in calcium, about tenfold, let's say normally it's about 100 uh, nanomolar, it goes up to 1,000 nanomolar. That makes the neuron release its neurotransmitter, makes the pineal gland release melatonin, makes the mast cell release histamine, and the pancreas beta cells causes it to release insulin, and all the muscle cells, skeletal, smooth, and cardiac muscles, it causes them to contract, and the platelets cause them to be activated, more prone to clotting. So these are all the things that elevated intracellular calcium will do. After the effect occurs, you want to get that calcium out of the cytoplasm as fast as possible. You can pump it out with things like the NACA exchanger, Na for sodium, Ka for calcium, uh, which is coupled to this electrochemical gradient produced by the potassium sodium ATPase. You can also just pump the calcium out of the cytoplasm into the endoplasmic reticulum. It's called circa because S is really for muscle cells. They have what's called a sarcolemma, okay, sarcoplasma. And other cells, you just call it endoplasmic reticulum, okay, calcium ATP is. And that's an ATP-dependent pump to pump calcium out of the cytoplasm. All right, so this is just more of the same when the cell's at rest. Normally, it's about 100 nanomolar, you know, 15,000 times less than... When it's then uh, outside the cell. Okay, here's a cell more like when it's active. You know, glutamate, the excitatory neurotransmitter, let's say it binds the AMPA receptor, lets sodium in, depolarizes the cell. Once the cell's depolarized, meaning its charge becomes more positive, its plasma membrane gradient, then magnesium is no longer attracted to the inner part of the cell. Previously, it was attracted to that negative 65 millivolts. When this starts becoming more, uh, you have a smaller resting membrane potential, the magnesium jumps out of the center of the NMDA channel. Glutamate is binding to that, and that will then allow calcium to come into the cell and exert an effect. Okay, glycine also binds it. That's why glyphosate can activate it as well, um, which glyphosate is sort of like a glycine with a phosphate on it. That's essentially what it is. Okay, then there's also something. These are ionotropic channels, meaning they just let the ions come through, like the calcium, or in this case, the sodium. But this is called a metabotropic, meaning that it exerts uh, effect through secondary mes messengers, like a G-protein coupled receptor. Okay, so anyways... This is also the IP3 component where IP3 then goes and causes calcium to come out of the endoplasmic reticulum. And this rhinodyne uh, receptor is also related to the same process where it's activated by calcium from the IP3 channel. Anyways, you can then have an, an enzyme cascade. So that's all well and good. Just kind of another reminder. All this stuff starts from increased calcium entry. Uh, this is just the concept of excitotoxicity. If you release too much glutamate to the postsynaptic neuron, it'll become overactivated. And if you really send way too much gl uh, glutamate over to it, you'll get too much calcium coming into it, and that can activate uh, harmful enzymes like calpain. The perfect name, calcium pain, because it damages things. It'll even, activated calpain can even um, block and destroy the NCX, the NACA exchanger, such that you then can't pump calcium out of the cell effectively and you'll get more calcium accumulating in there and that creates basically a vicious cycle, positive feedback upon itself to amplify itself in a detrimental way. Okay, um, but kind of the point of all this is how calcium is the dominant thing in the center of the show running things. All right, another point I'm gonna make briefly here is that volatile organic compounds, things that smell bad like paints and glues, adhesives, uh, benzenes, they, um, toluene, formaldehyde, xylene, okay, these things, if it smells bad, it's bad for you. In general, that's true. Not always, but usually true. So try to avoid these things. If you have to work with these chemicals, uh, avoid them. Try not to move next to a big factory pumping out tons of pollution. Um, these will cause increased reactive oxygen species degeneration in your cells and oxidative stress. Oxidative stress means there's more oxidants toxic things causing oxidation than there are 
antioxidants things, to reduce things, to, to move it back to good. So your antioxidants, the way you get antioxidants is because you get them from a plant. Because imagine you and a plant, let's say a rose, are out in the middle of a field that's 100 degrees hot. You as an animal, you're going to go walk under a tree, get in the shade or another shelter for yourself, a house, a uh, whatever, a teepee or something, whatever. But the plant can't go anywhere. It has to stay out in the hot sun, 100 degrees out. So it can only protect itself with chemicals. And those chemicals are called antioxidants. When we eat the plant, we get them. You don't get them from an animal because the animal's already used them up. Okay, here's an example of things that lower circa function. So again, circa is sarcoplasm, endoplasmic reticulum, calcium ATPase. That's the pump to pump calcium out of the cytoplasm into the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, being fat, having diabetes, all these heavy metals, uh, food preservatives, food dyes, uh, halogens, okay? So what you're going to notice, if you look at this list closely, is that lots of things that inhibit mitochondria also inhibit circa. And that's kind of one of the points I'm making. Circa inhibitors, excitotoxins, and mitochondrial inhibitors, they're all kind of the same thing because they all eventually, one way or the other, lead to increased cytoplasm calcium, okay? Okay, and the kinds of problems you'll get, you'll get uh, increased risk of diabetes. So circa inhibitors are related to increasing diabetes risk. Mitochondrial injury, because it's a long story, but eventually you're going to end up with too much calcium in the mitochondria from the overload in the cytoplasm. And um, so that's a problem. That's the cell's going to die because of that. Um, congestive heart failure, you get hypertension, okay, and a bunch of other problems. What can you do? Get your exercise, avoid circa inhibitors. Eat your plant foods, manage your stress, the usual stuff. You can get a vicious cycle going where circa inhibitors cause worse diabetes and the worse diabetes causes more advanced glycation end products that further glycate circa and decrease its function. You've heard my theory plenty of times, you know, basically excessive amounts of stimulants without adequate amounts of oxygen and glucose delivery to meet the increased energy demands leads to apoptosis of the neurons. I got other, plenty of other lectures where I go in that in more detail. You've seen a mitochondria before, outer mitochondrial membrane, OMM, intermembrane of space between the outer and the inner membrane. That's where the protons get pumped. Inner membrane, the hydrogen proton pumps around here to pump it into this space here, intermembrane of space. Mitochondrial matrix is just where Krebs cycle occurs. Okay, here's showing the electron transport chain, like a fireman bucket brigade, handing electrons down until it reaches oxygen, the ultimate electron acceptor. Uh, this just shows normal electron transport from complex one. Really kind of skips complex two, but complex two itself generates electrons. They go to coenzyme Q, then to complex three, then to cytochrome C, then to complex four. You're pumping out all these protons, establishes a proton gradient. The gradient is harvested by bringing a proton back through ATP synthase. Very high gradient, like negative 160 millivolts, the highest gradient in the human body that I'm aware of. Okay, and here's what I think is a really cool slide. These are all the things that inhibit mitochondria. And it's kind of the, the you know, round up the usual suspects, the same things that inhibit circa in general. The heavy metals like lead, uh, like mercury, um, aluminum also is toxic to the mitochondria. Cadmium is also toxic. Here's GP, glyphosate is toxic. So that's, you know, sprayed like on the processed soy. Here's atrazine, okay? So basically, these are like two of the most common things you'll get out of processed food. This is sprayed on corn typically. This is sprayed on soy typically. That's why I would never eat this unprocessed, non-organic crap food. It's terrible for you. Okay, you're inhibiting your mitochondria. This is estrogenic effects. This is an excitotoxin and a mitochondrial inhibitor. Stay away from this garbage. Also, a lot of medicines. You know, I've had a lot of genius doctors tell me, oh, don't you think people should take metformin to improve their aging? I'm like, yeah, right. Are you freaking stupid? It's an inhibitor of complex one, okay, and mitochondria electron transport. Yeah, I'm going to take a, a, a complex one inhibitor to make myself healthier. Yeah, like I believe that. Let me sell you a bridge. Okay, statins also can have a negative effect upon coenzyme Q. You know, most people, you know, you might have some type of familiar hyperlipidemia and have a problem with it, but, you know, most people, they can control their lipids pretty well with their diet. That's what I do. I don't take any pills. Tylenol, people think, oh, it's no big deal. Well, yeah, actually, it's a mitochondria inhibitor. I wouldn't take it, you know. Antifungals quite often are mitochondria inhibitors of complex two. Titanium dioxide nanoparticles are complex 
uh, two inhibitors as well. They're in a lot of things, medications, for example, sunscreens, a lot of personal care products. Propofol actually is a, a complex two inhibitor. It's another reason why I don't like an anesthesia. You know, in terms of like if I, I, first of all, I never had to have surgery and I hope I never do my whole life. But if I did, I would look for a way to get a, away from having general anesthesia. If I could, I'd be afraid of it having a negative effect on my memory. Okay, a lot of antibiotics are mitochondrial toxins. Um, other things will inhibit the Krebs cycle in the mitochondrial matrix, like traumatic brain injury, arsenic, alcohol. So they're also going to have a similar effect. Excessive amounts of these other uh, metals, like zinc, uh, iron. Iron can also catalyze the Fenton reaction, Fe for Fenton, Fe for iron, in your mitochondria, you know, of superoxide converting it into a hydroxyl radical, and that can lead to lipid peroxidation destruction of the inner mitochondrial membrane. So you want to avoid these as best you can. So I thought this was kind of a cool slide. The idea, do all lead, roads lead to Rome? And you can say that in a physical way, in a spiritual way. The world would be better off if we had more uh, Christians love thy neighbor, you know, turn the other cheek and uh, help each other and create some beautiful art. And I gave previous lectures about why are the Christians so much better than all the other uh, religions at making beautiful art and literature and painting and they have the best architecture, you know, and maybe it's because they have the best metaphysics. But anyways, that's not what this lecture is about. Here's what it's about. All these things cause increased cytoplasm, calcium. They're all toxic to your neurons. They all cause the destruction of brain cells, the loss of brain cells, like through apoptosis. And it's pretty simple. How do you avoid this? Well, don't add salt to your food. Don't eat processed food because it's got tons of salt in it. Don't eat meat because it's usually flavored with uh, salt and often preserved with salt. Okay? Eat plant foods. they got tons of potassium and magnesium, so you'll get enough of those. most common dietary deficiency is potassium, magnesium, and fiber. Where, you get, where do you get that? All from plant foods. Also, you got to watch out for oxidative stress, like with some of these pathways over here. Well, how do you prevent oxidative stress? Well, you eat more plant foods, you have more antioxidants, okay? How about traumatic brain injury? Well, don't do sports where there's traumatic brain injury, okay? It's not rocket science, all right? Mitochondria inhibitors, I just showed you the slide with all of them. You can avoid almost all of them. Certainly, you can, even the ones you can't completely avoid, you can largely avoid them. Circa inhibitors, we talked about that. You can largely, almost completely avoid those. Most people can. Uh, this stuff down here, avoid it to the extent you can. Not always so easy. Manage your stress. Get your sleep. Don't drink anything with caffeine in it. I think coffee makes you stupid. Okay, I know it's sort of a glamorous thing in you know, medical and academic centers. It's cool to drink coffee. Actually, it's not. If you study it, you won't want to do it anymore. Okay, uh, lack of blood flow to the brain, ischemia. All right, um, leaky gut, leaky gums. That's the whole calipratorius theory. I talked about that plenty in other lectures, so I'm not going to go through it. But basically, avoid things that cause leaky gut. Take good care of your teeth. Okay, avoid all these exotoxins. Don't eat anything with MSG, MFG, aspartame, GP. Um, don't take any stimulants. So it's pretty easy to do, and you'll be much more likely to prolong uh, optimal brain function. So hope that's helpful.